The infinite vasts of the universe hold endless possibilities and secrets. And here's one of the intriguing questions. How life and we as humans would look like on other planets. Imagine a world where the laws of physics, the environment, and the conditions are vastly different from what we're used to. How would we adapt and evolve to survive in these strange new lands? Let's see. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun and has a thin atmosphere. The temperatures there are extreme, with the day side reaching over 800 degrees Fahrenheit and the night side dropping to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So, what can we do to survive these crazy temperatures and constant solar radiation? Maybe we can magically turn into metal. For example, titanium and platinum can perfectly tolerate high temperatures. But seriously though, there is an option. We could settle underground, where the temperatures aren't so frenzied. If we lived underground, we might evolve with large eyes to better capture light. We might also evolve thicker skin to protect ourselves from the intense radiation. Basically, we have two options, become metal or become moles. Let's move on to Venus. This planet is extremely hostile. First of all, Venus is known for its thick, more toxic than your ex type of atmosphere. The whole planet is covered with carbon dioxide and its surface is absolutely dry, making it incredibly hot. The average temperature is around 847 degrees Fahrenheit, making it one of the hottest planets in our solar system. Also, don't forget about the crazy pressure. Standing on Venus would be like standing 3,000 feet underwater. Only particular hardy microbes from Earth could survive in such conditions. So, if you want to live on Venus, you might have to become a microbe. But, unfortunately, since we're not microbes, we have to wear special gear and equipment to survive there. Maybe we'd have to develop a heat-resistant exoskeleton to protect ourselves, as well as get some new lungs that can filter out the toxic elements in the atmosphere. Let's talk about our favorite red sibling, Mars. The first noticeable change after a few hundred years would be your new skeleton. The gravity on Mars is much weaker than on Earth, so your muscles and bones would shrink. To make up for this difference, you'd have to eat more and probably start going to the gym. Also, you'd have to adapt to the low atmospheric pressure and colder temperatures. You need to retain heat, right? That means you need a thicker layer of body fat. Sorry folks, but on Mars, we might become fatter. Another reason to start working out. Another big change would occur in your skin. Your skin is like a big barrier that protects you from harmful things such as bacteria, UV light, looking totally creepy, and so on. So what would happen to it? Most likely, you would turn orange, due to the carotenoids. Carotenoids are a type of nutrient that you get from foods such as carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, and so on. They protect very well against ultraviolet radiation on Mars. They only have one downside. By eating a lot of pumpkins from the Martian farmer's market, you'll gradually start to turn orange. But maybe it's not so bad. Maybe life on Jupiter would be easier. Yeah. No, it has no solid land. This planet is made up of hydrogen and helium and is referred to as a gas giant. You would simply float there, like in a huge cloud. And even if you managed to land and tried to walk, it would be like moving through a super thick fog. So how would we evolve there? Firstly, we might become much larger in size to withstand the immense pressures. Secondly, the temperature fluctuations on Jupiter are enormous. The surface is terrifyingly cold and the temperature rises significantly under the outer layers of the atmosphere. Thirdly, if you lived on Jupiter, there would be no verbal language. This gas giant absorbs radio waves, so even if you were speaking, no one would hear you. There would be no music either, so no parties. And what's the point then? Hey, maybe we could communicate with sign language, but that's not so simple either. Jupiter is full of wild winds and storm clouds, so it's unlikely you would be able to see anything. So even if we evolved there in some way, our lives would still not be easy. Before landing on Saturn, you would probably want to check out its iconic rings, but you wouldn't be able to do that because Saturn's rings consist of a bunch of ice particles flying in space, so it would be extremely hard to land. So, let's go straight to Saturn itself. At first, it may seem that Saturn is not bad for us, 
Some layers of this gas giant have quite pleasant temperatures. If we dive deeper into Saturn, it gets surprisingly warm, up to 26 degrees Fahrenheit in its second layer. This is an average temperature in countries like Sweden and Canada. But unfortunately, this is only one such layer. The rest of the planet is incredibly cold, so in order to survive on Saturn, we'd have to do a lot of work. In addition to the cold, we'd have to deal with the planet's harsh environment, including its intense storms, strong winds, and radiation. To protect ourselves from these conditions, we'd need to evolve tough skin again, find some insulation, and so on. Next planet is Uranus. Uranus has a very different environment from Earth, with much colder temperatures, a lack of a solid surface, and a much different atmosphere. It's like another Jupiter, but with blue vibes. It's not that bad, though. There's even water on Uranus. The only problem is, the planet is full of ammonia, that nasty stuff we use for cleaning. So don't be surprised if you feel the gross smell. Also, it's incredibly cold out there, almost like a never-ending winter. So what would it be like to survive in such a dark and harsh environment? We'd need thicker skin, again, to cope with extreme temperatures. And again, we'd need larger eyes to see better in all this darkness. We might even have to develop a new hearing system, like that of dolphins. Wouldn't that be fun? Let's move on to Neptune. If human beings were to evolve on Neptune, they would need to adapt to its harsh conditions. Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from our sun, is another gas giant. The only difference is this planet may have a solid core. If we were to live on Neptune, we'd need to float or swim in its methane-rich atmosphere. We'd also need to develop gills or something like that in order to breathe. Basically, we turn into space reptiles or cosmic fishes. The gravity on Neptune is slightly stronger than Earth's, but strong winds make it difficult to stand in one place. To withstand the wind, we need to be much heavier. Once again, you need to eat a lot and pump up some muscles. Yeah, yeah, technically it's not a planet, but we still love it and can't forget it. A small, distant, and incredibly cold world. Pluto's even smaller than our moon, and because of that, there's almost no gravity there. It will be extremely difficult to stand on it. To avoid accidentally flying into outer space while playing football, we need to create a fake gravity machine. And if we don't want to feel dizzy, we need to evolve a brand new nervous system. But Pluto isn't all that bad. For example, there's liquid water under the surface and even some icy mountains. Maybe it would be possible to survive there if we had some serious equipment, clothes, supplies, and nah, too much hassle. Anyway. From the scorching heat of Mercury to the freezing temperatures of Neptune, each planet has a unique set of environmental challenges and opportunities for evolution. While we may never truly know what humans would look like on these other worlds, it's exciting to consider the endless possibilities. Never stop looking at the stars and asking these questions. I hope you feel well rested, because I've got a tough task for you. Don't worry, it's fun. You're going to visit different planets of our solar system and try to run on each of them. Let's figure out where you can run the fastest and where you can barely walk. The fastest man on Earth, Usain Bolt, can run with an average speed of about 23 miles per hour. But his top speed is higher, up to 27 miles per hour. Sadly, we can't all be Usain Bolts. The average person runs at a speed of 6 to 8 miles per hour. But maybe, there's a planet out there where you can beat the famous Jamaican sprinters' records. But first things first, what will affect your speed when you run on other planets? For one thing, gravity. Depending on how strong it is on the planet you visit, it'll influence your weight. And in most cases, the heavier you are, the more slowly you run. Plus, on all other planets in our solar system except Earth, you'll have to wear a bulky spacesuit. Without it, your chances of survival there are non-existent. And don't forget about extreme weather conditions on most planets. It's either freezing cold or boiling hot, or very, and I mean it, windy. Anyway, your amazing journey is about to begin. Buckle your seatbelt. The first planet on your itinerary is Mercury. As you sneak a peek at this world through the window of your spaceship, you notice that the planet looks eerily similar to the good old moon. But just a few moments later, you realize it's just an illusion. All over the surface of Mercury, you see craters left by space rocks. 
Hmm, this may make your task of running on this planet way harder. This and your bulky spacesuit. Duh. But you wouldn't survive on Mercury without this protection. The temperatures on the planet are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Hey. But there's one thing that can work in your favor on this unfriendly planet. Let's say you weigh 155 pounds on Earth. Then on Mercury, you'd weigh around 58 pounds. Which means that despite your bulky spacesuit, you can move way faster than you do on Earth. And maybe your speed will even reach 13 miles per hour if you try really hard. The next planet on your itinerary is Venus, also called the Morning Star. While coming closer, you see a world very different from the bluish planet you might have seen in books. Before landing, you have to get through a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. And while your spacecraft is descending, you're watching thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. Venus is often called Earth's twin because these two planets are of similar size and density. No wonder that on Venus, you weigh almost as much as you do on Earth, 140 pounds. So your weight is a bit smaller here, but don't forget about your spacesuit. And still, because of almost the same conditions on the two planets, you'd be able to run a bit faster than on Earth at around 8.5 miles per hour. Your first impression of Mars is that it's freezing cold. The average temperature here is about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Even from afar, the planet looks reddish. Once you make your first step on the Martian surface, you understand why. The ground's covered with rusty colored dust. The same fine dust is floating in the air around you. Wherever you look, you see golden, brown, tan, and even greenish hues. They depend on the minerals that make up the soil. The size of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's around seven feet thick. Hmm, that can make running much more difficult. On Mars, your weight would be much smaller than on Earth, a mere 58 pounds. This will help you achieve an impressive speed of 12 miles per hour. <laughs> Aren't you a champ? What's that on the horizon? It looks like a tornado. Is it a dust storm? then it's time to make a run for it. Dust storms sometimes cover the entire planet, and you can even see the largest ones from Earth. And now you're facing a problem. You see, Jupiter, as well as Saturn, is a gas giant. This means that the largest planet in the solar system, and Jupiter is so large it could swallow 1,300 Earths, doesn't have any solid surface. Well, you'll just have to imagine what your running workout would look like if you could run on Jupiter. This planet has an atmosphere that consists of hydrogen and helium gas. During your descent, you admire thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. On Jupiter, you'd weigh 390 pounds. You'd have to break a sweat to simply walk there wearing your clumsy spacesuit. If you could step on the planet's surface, that is. If you tried to run there, your best result would probably be a speed of one or two miles per hour. To make matters worse, it's extremely windy on Jupiter, with the wind speeds ranging from 200 to 400 miles per hour. Do you see those rings? That's Saturn, another gas giant with no solid surface. This planet's made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, and its temperature and density change the deeper you go. If you decided to leave your spacecraft and step on Saturn's surface, you'd just fall into the planet. But from above, it looks as if Saturn does have a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by several layers of clouds. The visible outer layer is made up of ammonia clouds. Under them, there are hydrosulfide clouds. And the innermost layer is made up of clouds of water. Even though Saturn is a gas giant, your weight wouldn't be very different here, around 165 pounds. That's because the planet's gravity is similar to that of Earth. But because of the conditions on the planet, and your bulky, bulky spacesuit, you'd run a bit more slowly there, at a speed of about 4 miles per hour. Before leaving, you admire Saturn's most famous feature, awesome gray, beige, and tan rings. These groups of tiny ringlets are made of chunks of rock and ice, you also spot several of the 53 moons of Saturn. Oh, that's Titan, 
an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. The next planet on your way is a blue-green ball of ice and gas. That's ice giant Uranus. It has this beautiful hue because the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Uranus isn't solid. Hit the brakes! If your spacecraft doesn't manage to stop in time, it'll fly through the upper atmosphere and sink into the icy liquid center of the planet. Hmm, I doubt you'll be able to conduct your running experiment here. So, let's just imagine what it'd look like. On Uranus, your weight would be around 138 pounds. And, against all odds, you could actually reach a good speed here, at least 8 miles per hour. If you didn't get caught in a hurricane, of course. Extreme storms occur on the planet in the summer, when Uranus is heated the most. Then, hurricanes can spread for more than 6,000 miles. The furthest planet from the Sun, Neptune, is four times the size of Earth, but 17 times as heavy. The blue surface you see when approaching Neptune is actually a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. The planet's mantle is made up of water, ammonia, and methane ices. It's the closest thing Neptune has to a surface. And still, there isn't solid ground for you to walk on. So, once again, try to use your imagination. On Neptune, you'd weigh a bit more than you do on Earth, 174 pounds. But your running speed would be just a bit lower than on Earth, around 5 miles per hour. That's the end of your active adventure! Which planet did you like running on the most? You fly away from Earth at a safe distance in your super modern spaceship, and then BAM! You travel faster than the speed of light in interstellar space. How cool! The light from thousands of stars rushes past you. A few minutes, and you're on the other side of the Milky Way and going to work. Such travel has long been common for humans. For you are a member of the human civilization that has conquered the entire galaxy. But it took almost 90 million years to get there. So how did we achieve this? It's like a computer game. In the beginning, we had a fleet of three motherships that could travel at 310 miles per second. Each of them had 10 colonization pads. The ship could undock a pad and drop it on the desired planet. We also had two speed ships that traveled twice as fast but could only colonize one planet. Each colonized planet could send one new ship on an expedition. So humanity was able to spread across the galaxy in 90 million years. Most of that time was spent flying from star to star. So the main problem of colonization is speed. Year 2021. Our spaceships can now fly at about 24,850 miles per hour. That's enough speed to travel from New York to Los Angeles in less than 4 minutes. But a trip to neighboring planets like Mars still takes about 7 months. The nearest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away. That means light, the fastest thing in the universe, takes 4.2 years to get there from the Sun. It would take our rocket 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than an advanced human civilization has existed. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 105,000 light years wide. So even traveling at the speed of light would take forever. So naturally, humanity came up with other ways to travel. Let's move into the future and imagine that we've solved this problem. We started accelerating with microscopic probes propelled by a directional laser beam from Earth. This made it possible to reach speeds of 25% of the speed of light, still very slow. The problem was that nothing that has mass can travel at the speed of light. So we moved on to the Alcubierre drive study. This method doesn't involve moving from point A to point B, but instead compressing the space between those points. Here's a piece of checkered paper. Imagine that you need to travel three squares to your destination. Instead of moving in a straight line as fast as possible, we squeeze these squares so that our spaceship is at point B. Now we unsqueeze them back. Space is normalized and we've traveled, in fact, standing still. This is how the Alcubierre drive works. It compresses space in front of the spaceship and expands it behind its tail. So, theoretically, an Alcubierre drive spaceship can move at any speed, even faster than the speed of light. But the amount of energy needed to do this is enormous, and it could be compared to the mass energy of the entire planet of Jupiter. So, while some scientists were working to improve the Alcubierre drive, others were looking inside the most mysterious object in the universe, a black hole. A black hole is something so heavy that it attracts even light and won't let it go. 
Imagine a circular trampoline. This is our space-time. We put a basketball in its center. The trampoline sags a little bit. Now all the objects we put on the trampoline will roll toward the basketball. That's how gravity works. But if you roll the golf ball past the basketball, it has a chance of getting out of this funnel. Now put a heavy bowling ball in the center of the trampoline. The trampoline sags even more. Now the golf ball will inevitably fall into the funnel with the bowling ball with no chance of escape. That's how a black hole works. And some scientists believe there may be a wormhole at the heart of a black hole. It's a shortcut between point A and point B in the universe. Back to our piece of paper. Instead of moving straight ahead, we fold the piece so that point A is right above point B. Now we make a hole in the paper and move to point B. We unfold it back and voila, you've arrived at your destination. So there's a theory that if a spaceship enters the black hole's gravitational field and withstands the incredible stress there, it can exit to any other point in the universe which that wormhole led to. It might even be another galaxy, or even a parallel universe. Well, our research was successful, and now, looking at a map of the Milky Way, we can get to absolutely anywhere. All that remains is to choose the right place to colonize. There are about a billion stars. Around each of them are planets possibly suitable for life. So we need to narrow down the list. First, we look for relatively young stars, almost like our sun. Near them, a human colony can potentially live for a long time. After that, when a star gets old, it begins to expand and turn red. In the last stages of its life, it can absorb all the planets around it and then explode with such force that the light from the explosion can be seen dozens of light years away. Secondly, the candidate for a human colony must be in the habitable zone of the star. It's a sweet spot, not too far away from and not too close to the star, so that it's not too cold or too hot there. In other words, water on the planet must exist in liquid form. Also, the candidate planet must have a solid surface, so that we can live on it. Another important factor is the size of the planet. If it's too big, its gravitational force will press on us. It'll be harder for us to jump, walk, and lift weights on this planet because we're used to the Earth's gravity. But if the planet is too small, we'll feel like real strongmen there. We'll be able to jump high and lift large weights. But then our muscles will lose tone and our health will deteriorate. So we're looking for a planet about the size of Earth. Altogether, we have about 100,000 star systems that fit our parameters, so we start exploring and colonizing. And here's our first target. We've named this planet New Home. Hmm, clever. We fire up our faster-than-light engine, and bam, we're there! Even though this planet fits all our criteria, it's still hard to call this place home. Desert landscapes with lots of craters and canyons. We'll have to work hard to make this place look like Earth. The terraforming phase of the planet is about to begin. That means we're going to change the climate and the atmosphere here. We need about 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen so we can breathe here without spacesuits. So we're launching air plants. Other plants will produce water. We're also building power plants and a plant to produce fuel for our spacecraft. Last but not least, food extraction. Once everything is ready, the colony here can exist on its own. And after several centuries, this planet will be developed and populated enough to send an expedition to colonize neighboring worlds. So for many millions of years, humanity has been weaving its web in the Milky Way. From one planet to another, we've colonized our galaxy. Humanity is now not only multiplanetary, but also interstellar. The next goal is to make us an intergalactic species. Here's our Milky Way. Zoom out. This is the local group of galaxies. Each one contains millions of stars, candidates for colonization. We have to travel 5 million light years to get there. Zoom out again. Virgo Supercluster. There are about 100 clusters of galaxies similar to our own. Zoom out again. Billion light years from our home. Neighboring superclusters. Now each galaxy looks like a little dot, and there are thousands and millions of them. Zoom out even more. 14 billion light years from Earth. This is our observable universe. There are about 2 trillion galaxies. Even at a thousand times the speed of light, it would take us billions of years to colonize even 1% of the stars here. But it's not over yet. There's a cold spot on the map of the observable universe. Some scientists think it's a scar from a collision of our universe with a neighboring one. They say the universes could be like bubbles, each containing trillions of galaxies. 
once such bubble crashed into ours, and its gravitational force ripped clusters of galaxies out of our universe. If this is true, then parallel universes do exist. Then we have truly endless possibilities for exploration, finding new worlds for humanity, and contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. Hmm, sounds like fun. There are many different conditions on other planets and moons that could affect how your pet would evolve there. Take gravity, for example. On a bigger or denser planet, gravity would be higher, meaning that life would evolve to be shorter, sturdier, and perhaps with multiple limbs for structural support. On a lighter planet with weaker gravity, life could hop, soar, and glide more easily, and would be more likely to evolve a lighter, taller build. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun, a dusty, cold, desert world. Mars is also a dynamic planet with seasons, polar ice caps, canyons, extinct volcanoes, and evidence that it was even more active in the past. Gravity on Mars is lower than on Earth, and it's farther from the Sun, so we would see less sunlight. Mars also has no protective magnetic field due to its thin atmosphere, exposing everything to radiation. Sometimes, strong winds create dust storms that howl around the whole planet, and the dust continues to settle for months after. Your pet dog on Mars would probably have a taller, robust build to compensate for poor gravity, and would have bigger eyes to better perceive the far-off sun. To protect itself from radiation, your dog would have to switch its pigmentation from melanin to carotenoids, which give carrots, tomatoes, and oranges their color. So the dog would probably have orange skin. Since Mars has weak gravity, your cat would probably be lighter and would jump more to get around the place. It would also have longer legs. Jupiter is called a gas giant. The planet is covered in thick red, brown, yellow, and white clouds. The clouds make the planet look like it has stripes. Living on the surface of Jupiter might prove to be challenging. Since there's no actual surface, the planet consists entirely of gas. But it doesn't mean it's just a giant cloud hanging in space. If you venture through its atmosphere to deeper parts, the gas becomes denser until it turns into liquid. So one layer of Jupiter is an ocean made of hydrogen instead of water. With high pressure, extreme temperatures, and a fluid environment, we'll have to draw some inspiration from deep water dwellers who deal with the same conditions but on a smaller scale. Your cats and dogs would be big isopods with shells to protect them from Jupiter's radiation. Like its fellow gaseous neighbor Jupiter, Saturn is a gargantuan cloud of hydrogen and helium with no solid land and powerful winds. Like Jupiter, it gets tighter within, but its core is much smaller. Its iconic rings are made of a myriad of ice particles, so nothing could live on them, unfortunately. Saturn's volume is greater than 760 Earths, and it's the second most massive planet in the solar system, about 95 times Earth's mass. Saturn's average density is less than water, so this behemoth of a planet could float in a bathtub if there were one of a suitable size. The only way to move within Saturn's thick fog is by flopping around like a jellyfish. Your dog would probably have an umbrella-shaped bell to propel itself up and no skeleton so that it wouldn't be crushed by the pressure. Your cat would have jellyfish tentacles to move around. Life is tough on Mercury. This tiny planet is closest to the sun, so the sunlight here is seven times more powerful than on Earth. No sunscreen would be able to manage that. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of Earth, with a similar gravity to Mars, or about 38% of Earth's gravity. This means that you could jump three times as high on Mercury, and heavy objects would be easier to pick up. Mercury's temperature is extreme, swinging between a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. It's all accompanied by constant meteor showers and quakes. As a bonus, there is a very thin atmosphere and no air to breathe. Flesh and bone could never handle these severe conditions. So instead, your pets here would be made of something similar to refractory metal, like titanium. There'd be no need for a respiratory system, so their pretty metal faces would be without a nose, and their eyes would probably look like thick sunglasses to protect them from all this sun exposure. If there's anywhere harder to live than on Mercury, it's Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun and is Earth's closest neighbor in the solar system. Venus is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, 
and sometimes looks like a bright star in the morning or evening sky. The temperature here is a whopping 880 degrees Fahrenheit, and the atmosphere is so thick, it creates a greenhouse effect. The surface is dry and full of surprises like volcanic eruptions, hurricane winds, and lightning. And as a cherry on top, the pressure here feels like you're one mile underwater, giving you a never-ending headache. It would be hard to imagine your pet living on Venus. The only things that could possibly survive there are anaerobic bacteria. Venus eats away at everything, even metal, making quick work of any human spacecraft. And Venus's atmosphere contains phosphine, which is toxic for anything that breathes oxygen, but means life for microbes. Icy, dark, and plagued by strong winds, Uranus and Neptune are mostly made of cold liquids, methane, water, and ammonia. Methane makes Uranus blue, and it has faint rings, while Neptune is dark, cold, and very windy, as it's the last of the planets in our solar system. It's more than 30 times as far from the Sun as Earth is. Neither of them has a solid surface, and their atmospheres slowly merge into the water around the planet's core. To boot, gravity on Neptune is stronger than on Earth and applies more pressure on everything. With such powerful gravity, your dog would be shorter, and your cat would be stockier, with muscular bodies and thicker skins against the cold. And considering the fluid environment, your pet's best bet is to become like a cosmic whale or manatee floating around the blue planets. Pluto is not very big. It's only half as wide as the United States. Pluto is smaller than Earth's moon. This dwarf planet takes 248 Earth years to go around the sun. If you lived on Pluto, you would have to wait 248 Earth years to celebrate your first birthday. One day on Pluto is about six and a half days on Earth. The farthest planet-like object from the sun is appropriately freezing cold and covered with ice, with weak gravity and a flimsy atmosphere. The sun, from Pluto, is nothing more than a dot on the horizon, much like the moon for Earth, so there's not much going on in terms of light. But scientists suggest that there may be a water ocean under Pluto's surface and some nicer weather. Let's take notes from Earth's creatures with built-in antifreeze, like some insects and fish. Low gravity makes the muscles and bones shrink and the space between vertebrae expand, making your pets taller. Their posture would also change, since their spine, for the most part, would be out of a job. So they'd probably be tall, thin, and somewhat spider-like, with spindly limbs and a curved spine. On other planets beyond the solar system, the boundaries between plants and your pets could be blurred, and your pets might merge with plant life. Your pets might become tree-like, with beating hearts attached to their bodies, or with feet to move to better positions as they compete for light and water. You could also have a rabbit that spends most of its time staying still, photosynthesizing, and only running away if threatened. Or a massive dinosaur-like horse that splays itself out on the ground to get nutrients directly from the soil and obtains extra energy with the help of plants on its back. Cooperation could lead to some fascinating pets, such as a sea of amoeba acting as a single jelly-like mega-creature, thousands of voracious shrimp-like carnivores forming a single organism that devours anything in its way, or a web of intertwined trees that collect water in wide pitchers at the top of their canopies. Getting oxygen to muscles is a key for your pet's endurance. Here on Earth, octopuses use a copper-based molecule in their blood to shuttle oxygen, making them more sluggish than mammals and birds that use iron-based hemoglobin. Scientists have speculated about other types of oxygen transport that could make animals fitter. In atmospheres with more oxygen, we might see a pet monkey that can fly without ever having to stop for a rest. On cold planets and moons without much sunlight, such as the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, your pet dog might have to get by with chemical energy rather than take it from the sun. Also, in worlds without light, such as the depths of Enceladus's oceans, there might be little need to evolve eyes. Pets would probably sense their environments using other means, like gills and vibration sensors. We all remember seeing the Apollo lunar rover on the moon built for space missions in the 70s. Besides transporting astronauts for certain explorations, they were used for taking pictures and collecting soil samples for scientists to study. The vehicle was designed by Boeing, the company famous for building airplanes, and cost around 38 million bucks to build. The kind of loose change you'd find today in Elon Musk's couch. 
In the far future, technologies will be so advanced that a regular car for the moon will behave like a regular SUV we have today. It'll have a sleek look and might be produced by some famous car manufacturers available. Back then, the lunar rover used a T-shaped throttle to move the car left, right, backward, and forward. The futuristic one can be voice-controlled and require minimal human control. And we can't leave out the Earth roof. Hey, you really don't need a moon roof on the moon. Anyway, the moon's driving conditions are not that extreme compared to Mars or other planets. It's hard to believe that the first landing craft to enter Mars was Viking 1, launched on August 20, 1975. It arrived at Mars on June 19, 1976. But decades later, Curiosity, which had six legs and six wheels attached, took the stage as the cute robot explorer. It was designed for the rough terrain, so in the distant future, a human-operated vehicle can have a similar design for people who want to cruise by the Mars sunset. For any human-designed car to work on planets other than the Earth, they have to be electric or anything else that can produce an unlimited supply of energy. Gas-powered vehicles won't work in the vacuum of space, and certainly not on any planet other than our own. It can be powered by the strong sun and convert the energy to run the vehicle. The interior has to accommodate the extreme conditions on the planet, since the atmosphere is very thin and unbreathable. It has to be very warm, since Mars can reach sub-zero temperatures. The matter of gravity isn't that extreme, but frequent dust storms are the problem. The vehicle will also have wheels attached to legs to maneuver around properly, since the terrain is difficult to get around in. Now, my two cents here? Well, I think an all-leather interior with six-way seats front and back will be nice. Adding a 12-speaker sound system with RU Sirius FM radio is a must. Did I mention the earth roof? Yeah, I did. And don't forget the 60-40 fold-down rear seats so you'll have plenty of room to haul your camping gear on your weekend escapes. Meanwhile, it's still possible to have a panoramic glass view of the interior in a project like a tour bus on Mars. There are plenty of locations to discover, like the tallest mountain in our solar system and the snowy carbon peaks. The Red Planet can also have an express train ride that can take you from one place to another. It'll be one of those luxurious cabins that will take you from one landmark to another since Mars becomes colonized and established. The train will also be electric-powered or powered by another power source. Mars is a place where it's possible to have all kinds of vehicles, since the conditions aren't that different from Earth's. Just don't go outside without a helmet. If we designed a vehicle for Mercury, then get ready for bright light from the sun, in which case we would need to add industrial visors and blackout strips around the glass so that the sun won't get to us. At least we won't have to worry about the heat, since Mercury isn't the hottest planet in our solar system. Well, the temperatures can reach a soaring 800 degrees on a warm sunny day and drop down to minus 300 degrees at night. The vehicle will have to have multiple layers and coatings to withstand the conditions. And it will most likely have spider legs to move, since rubber wheels will melt instantly. And to save itself from damage, it'll need to dig underground to hide from the sun and atmosphere, just like a crab or those spiders that create hatch floors. Driving a vehicle on Pluto will be very challenging, considering that it's the furthest planet from the sun. Now, Pluto is technically not a planet anymore, but it's still a large enough mass to explore. Temperatures there can reach below 400 degrees. A mere jacket won't cut it. The vehicle will need super insulation to keep the operator warm and fuzzy. Methane ice surrounds the land and covers the mountains. Gravity is also an issue since it's very weak, which will make you float in the air. Now, designing a vehicle for Pluto will be tricky. The key for it to move and not freeze will be how the legs move. It'll also have legs like the one on Mercury, but will have a lot of heat generated to keep warm. The weight is enough to keep this vehicle in place. However, that can't be said for Neptune, the windiest planet in our solar system. It's impossible to breathe in the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure will crush you. Designing a vehicle is challenging, considering the many external factors, and will have to be pressurized to counter the external atmosphere. It will also need a special coating to counter the harsh temperatures. And because Neptune is extremely windy, it would need some sort of anchor to keep it in place. Something like a large drill that shoots from the belly of the car and digs underground. 
It will also have spider legs to move around, but they'll behave in a similar motion to how a camel walks. That way, it can maintain its center of gravity. Now, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees. The pressure will push your vehicle like a can, so it needs proper internal pressure to balance it out. This car will require all the upgrades for countering the heat. It will need proper coating, no glass, and even a special color to reflect the heat. Nothing can actually stay on the ground for too long, so spider legs won't really work. It'll need to hover slightly above the ground and float around. Now, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and has a very windy upper atmosphere and very strong gravity. The rings around it are made up of ice materials that can range from the size of a pebble to the size of a school bus. The pressure is so strong that you'd be crushed the second you reach its atmosphere. Designing a vehicle would be very challenging and weird. It'll need the best technology for withstanding the crushing pressures and harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be large and composed of many internal layers. Since the upper atmosphere is windy, the vehicle will have to remain on the ground for as long as possible. Scientists don't know much of what the surface looks like, so the vehicle will have to be prepared to move on solid surfaces, liquid, and anything else in between. Now, I think it's called slop. It'll need mechanical arms to maneuver through the possible rugged terrain and multiple legs like a centipede. Those arms can pick up things and move them out of the way if it faces some obstacles. The long body can also detach itself and break into smaller pods for a quick escape. From what, we don't yet know. No human can step foot outside even if they wear protective gear. Robots will have to be deployed to test how human bodies can withstand the conditions. Jupiter has harsher conditions than Saturn, with the red spot being the most dangerous area on the planet. It's an extremely large area that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for years. The vehicle will resemble that of Saturn, but extra heavy-duty. Scientists also don't know what's happening on the surface except for the crushing atmospheric pressure. The vehicle won't be able to move on the surface if it were to pass through the red spot, so it'll have to dig underground and move underneath. For that, it'll require a huge drill and many self-automated drones and vehicles that can be deployed from the main vehicle to help with digging and surveying. Once underground, it'll have legs that will help it crawl and a giant drill nose to dig further. Many of the body parts can also break off into smaller pods to get through certain terrains but can be easily reattached. The craziest place where we can launch a vehicle is the sun. There's no way to imagine it except being self-automated. Any human on board won't make it halfway in the journey. The launch will have to be from Mercury in a protective facility sheltered from the harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be made out of the best resources to withstand the extreme heat and gases and won't last more than a couple of minutes once nearby. It'll most likely resemble a satellite and float around to take some footage for us to study. It'll probably cost trillions of dollars, but the results will be worth it, won't they?